beginning a new series today all about freedom, free, freedom, discovering the divine you, and you understand something that everything God does has a purpose and a reason for it. If you look at creation, uh, there's a purpose for everything, and you were designed on purpose for a purpose. In fact, the Bible says, before you were formed in your mother, mother's womb, I knew about you, and so God has a purpose for every single person. We believe that. The problem is we lose that purpose through sin and we're separated from God. One of our objectives at Cornerstone is to help people understand that they're made in God's image and that he desires to have a relationship with them that they can discover the person they are created to be. And even when you give your life to Christ and you do that, there's still a process where you want to run forward. You, you, want to, you want to change the way you treat your spouse or your children. You want to change the way you eat or how you spend money or you want to get rid of an addiction or something or smoking or drinking or whatever it is or watching too much social media, whatever it is, and you just can't seem to get past it and these barriers. And maybe there's certain things in your life that you struggle with all your life. Maybe you're a procrastinator. And you're like, I'm so tired of procrastinating. I'll start tomorrow. <laughs> and, and, and you know, you find all these things in your life and they can get frustrating. And if you've been around for a while, you get tired of being tired. So you're like, you know what? I'm going to lower my standards because frankly, it's too difficult to move forward. And sometimes these new years can be a reminder of past failures, or perhaps a divorce, or perhaps a, a, a missed opportunity, or perhaps a, a relationship breaking, breaking down. Or perhaps failures you have. And, and you're just thinking, you know, I've tried so hard and so long and I'm tired of it. Some, only, uh, some of you are also uh, find great success. It seems like everything you do does well. You make, a, you make a goal, you achieve it, and you're really excited about this new year. So we all come from different points of view and different places. But you know what? The Bible says, weep with those who weep and rejoice with those who rejoice. You see, our objective is not to be successful just by ourselves, but to help each other to become what God has you to become. And so we should care about each other, so we should be lifting each other up. And I love it, and I think one of the models of this church is we don't compete, we complete each other. Isn't that a way to live our lives? That we rejoice when someone gets a pay raise. We rejoice when someone has children, even when you can't. We rejoice when someone is growing spiritually. Why? Because we're all lifting each other up. As, everyone, as you li are lifted up, we're all lifted up. Why? We believe, for those of us that are in Christ, that we're the body of Christ. But there's something in us that prevents us from achieving what God would have us to be. It can be very frustrating. And there, there's thousands and thousands of voices out there telling you how you're supposed to live your life from your subconscious to the thoughts you hear in your mind, to television, to advertising, to billboards, to social media, to tweets, posts, and Instagrams, and, and whatever grams you have. When I grew up, all we had was graham crackers. But anyhow, um, so we're gonna be talking about real free, how do we have real change. Today, we're gonna talk about something, how to position ourselves for real change. If you're looking for a message that's going to give you uh, one, two, three, four steps that you can do all by yourself, that's not it. Today's basic message is this. Become connected to God and everything else will eventually take care of itself. You see, God makes life so simple, but we complicate things. Sin complicates your life while God simplifies your life. It may be, it may be difficult, but it's simple and makes your life so much more clarity. You know, there's a lot of confusion in the world today. How many of you want to live a life that's simple, pure, and right? And this is what we have an opportunity to do. But we all have stuff that keeps coming up every single year. Or maybe you try for a while, and okay, I'm gonna try for a while. You do well. You do well for a while. And maybe two, three months, and all of a sudden you slip again. Oh, I knew I couldn't keep this thing going. No, I'll try again. You slip again. I'll try again. You finally forget it. I can't do it. And we get frustrated. We see, this is the issue. Salvation is not a one-time event. It's a process. Jesus said, I have come to give you life and life more abundantly. Those who call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. And the word, Greek word is sozo. And sozo includes redeemed, transformed. And so it's not just talking about salvation only. That's the beginning point. 
when God gets to deed in the ownership of your home, now there's renovations that will take place. I wish I could just buy a house and never do anything with it again. <laughs> uh, if you're a homeowner, you know that's not the If you're even a car owner, you know that's not the case. There's a process of keeping maintenance and also if you're in a house to upgrade and keep things going. And God wants to renovate you so you can become the best you you can ever imagine. I, I love watching these shows with my wife sometimes, and we watch these fl they flip for sales, whatever. They buy this junk, hunk of junk, and you're like, what are they doing? And they rip it up. There's mice and dead bodies and all that. <laughs> and then they turn it around, and it's absolutely beautiful. That's what God wants to do in our lives. He sees something maybe you don't even see. He sees maybe you're like, I, I'm, I'm too broken. I got too many termites in my life. I got too much brokenness in my life. You, you don't know. And God sees something. He sees in you what you can become. And the good news is, if God, can do, if God does it, nothing's impossible. And so I want to encourage you today. Salvation is not a one-time event. It is a process. So we have to change our minds about that. God is not done with you yet. And he's not done with me yet. Unless we think he's done, we don't allow him to be done. The basic foundation scripture we're going to have for our time together over these next four or five weeks, I think five weeks or so in this series, is found in John 8. If you want to turn your Bibles, I'm reading from the New King James Version and also the New Living Translation today and also ESV. And I change translations at times because I, I try to find the best one that communicates it. And I do look at the original Greek as well to make sure it's, it's a good translation. But um, one of my favorites is New King James, in case you're wondering why there's these different translations. There's some good ones and there's some bad ones. But uh, and nevertheless, I just wanted to mention, because people ask, why do you have different translations? Well, John 8, verse 31. Then Jesus said to those Jews who believed him. Let me just stop here for a second. I want to pray right now. I just, I just believe some of you are just discouraged this morning, and you're like, oh, no, another message about change. I don't want to change. Well, just, Father, in Jesus' name, I want to thank you for those watching online and those here right now, that you are the God of new beginnings. Behold, I make all things new. You're the God of new beginnings. You're the God that can do more than we could ask or imagine. And Father, I just pray today, this would be an opportunity to be encouraged, myself and the rest of us, God, that we would become the people um, that you've called us to become, Lord. You love us because you love us, but you love us so much you want to see us flourish and do well. And Father, I pray today would be an encouragement for us to go higher and farther than we ever have before in Jesus' name. Amen? Amen. Then Jesus said to the Jews who believed in him. He's talking to the church of his day. He's talking to believers. He's not talking to those outside the church. Okay, that's the context. He said this, if you abide, in other words, if you keep in my word, if you do what I tell you to do, if you abide, if you live, if you stay in my word, you are my disciples indeed, okay? And how do we know we're part of it? It takes a bit of work. Well, I thought it's all about grace. Yes, it's all about God's grace, but he gives us the grace to follow him that we can do what he's called us to do. If you abide in my word, you're my disciples indeed. Listen to this. And you will know the truth. And the word know is gnosko, which basically means intimate understanding, fully experienced. You will know the truth. And the truth will set you free. What does Jesus say? I am the what? I am the way. I am the? I am the life. So what sets you free? I just tell the truth like I see it. No, we're not talking about that kind of truth. We're talking about truth in a person, Jesus. You will know Jesus and he will set you free. It doesn't say he might. It's a definitive action here. We're not talking about a hope or a wish. It says you shall know the truth and the truth being Jesus will set you free. No ands, if, or buts. The truth shall make you free. Then they answered him, uh, you know, we're Abraham's descendants. 
In other words, hey, I've been coming to Cornerstone since I was a baby, or I, I grew up in the Catholic church, or I, I went to a monastery, or I did this or the other. We're Abraham's descendants, and I, I'm a assemblies of God. I, I'm Catholic, I'm Presbyterian, I, I'm an atheist, whatever. I'm just not an atheist, okay. Uh, we are Abraham's descendants and had never been in bondage to everyone. It always makes me laugh when I read that because they were slaves for 400 years, okay. How can you say you'll be made free? You see, the person that cannot be freed is the person who doesn't believe that they're in bondage. Some of you grew up in the Pentecostal movement, and uh, you ever hear of the Pentecostal buns? They really, now the buns are coming back. Even guys are wearing buns on their heads. You know what we call that? We call it bondage. But anyhow, <laughs> how can you say you will be made free? You can't be free if you don't believe you cannot be free. You can't be free if you don't realize the fact that you can be in bondage or you can be bound up to stuff. And so maybe today you would think, well, I'm a Christian. I have everything I need. Well, that's true. The potential is there for everything you need. But you're probably not experiencing everything God has for you, and neither am I. And God wants to give us more and more freedom. Why? He loves us and wants to see us to become the men and women of God. And so you can't be free because you don't believe you're in bondage. You gotta understand, all of us here today are in bondage. Look at your neighbor and say, you're in bondage. How, doesn't that make you feel good? Well, Jesus has set me free. Well, hold on, hold on. We're gonna make this uh, more clear. I probably don't like what I'm saying here, but the Bible talks about, I'll show you, just hang on with me here for a little bit. But the first step in finding freedom is gaining the knowledge that there are strongholds in your life. And one of the things that often happens is strongholds often become habits, right? Habits are wonderful blessings that God has given us. He gives us the ability to do something so often that we begin to do it automatically. And sometimes I'll be driving, and I'll end up driving to the church, I'm supposed to get a gallon of milk. Whoops, I went the wrong way. I'm just so used to driving a certain way, right? You know how to tie your shoes. You don't have to think anymore. Of course, thank God for Velcro and slip-ons. But anyhow, <laughs> but you get used to stuff, right? You get used to stuff and it becomes a habit. However, you can also get in bad habits. And often those are strongholds. Those are light, but sometimes they're even more than just bad habits. Sometimes they're literally demonic strongholds. I spoke about it uh, several weeks ago and I talked about um, finding freedom and talked about the demonic realm. You can go back and listen to that at cornerstonecheshire.com. I'm not gonna re-preach that today, but there is a spiritual war going on where the enemy's basic job is to throw a monkey wrench in your life and my life. The good news is greater that's he that's within me than he that's in the world. But the way that the enemy gets the access point primarily is through our minds and getting us to believe a lie instead of the truth. If the truth will set you free, then a lie will keep you bound. And so one of the greatest things we have to do is my people uh, are destroyed because they do not understand their lack of knowledge. And we want to give knowledge that has its word in action. We don't want to admit that we have issues in our lives. And uh, how would you... How, how many of you would like to have more freedom in your life? Just, you know, just be able to let some stuff go and, and, and next year you'd say, you know what, 2016 was the, day, was the year I gave up smoking. It was the day I stopped procrastinating and I won't start tomorrow, I'll start today. I mean, all the, and you just have found your marriage is back on track, your, you, your studies, your grade point has gone up and you're, you're, you're happy, you're healthy, you're doing well. How many of you know people, how many people know somebody that is bound to something? They just can't control themselves. They're bound to alcohol, drugs, or there's something in their lives that it just, they just can't get over it. It's just, you see them, they talk about it, and they're just bound. They're, how many people know people like that? No one? Come on, everybody, let's all participate. We all know someone like that, right? That's bound by sin. How many here are bound by sin? Raise your hand. Wow, you guys are more honest than I thought you'd be. <laughs> you maybe... That's the thing is that most of us have areas of our lives, you know, we think every, we know everyone else has got problems, but sometimes it's us. You guys are really honest. Wow, I didn't expect that today. You guys are amazing. But let me, let me ask you another question. Do you think that God can set us free? Yes. Okay, do you believe that God can set us free? That's all part of it. See, the problem often is, and this church is different, that we don't admit it at times that we have problems. And you know, an addiction is when you do something that you don't wanna do, 
and you can't seem to control yourself, and you keep going back. That's an addiction. And I would say all of us, to a certain degree, are addicts. But, you know, I, my name is Pastor Eric Gucci, and I'm an addict. Uh-oh, what are you addicted to? <laughs> I'm addicted to sin. <laughs> I am. I, I tried my best. There's some areas of my life that I wish I'd stop doing. You know, I wish I'd stop robbing banks when I'm out of money. I, I just... <laughs> No, I'm just kidding. But we all have areas. You know, maybe you want to get up earlier and read your Bible. Maybe you don't want to lose your temper. Or maybe you want to change the way you're spending your money. Or whatever it is. It could be something small that has very little consequence, uh, ramifications. Or it can be something that has great collateral damage to those that love you and know you. But it's all the same process. You see, what does Jesus say about that? Jesus says this. How can, how can you say that we're slaves? And they say, hey... We're not enslaved to anybody, they say. Look what Jesus has to say in the following verse. Jesus answered them and said this, Most assuredly I say to you, whoever commits sin is a what? Slave to sin. Now let me ask you a question. How many of you commit sins? You sinners? No. That means you're a slave to sin. According to Jesus, if you commit sin, you're a slave to sin. Think about it for a moment. If you and I did not commit any more sins, we'd be completely free. Truth of the matter is, you and I had different slaveries in our life. We're enslaved. Listen, it, it, think about it. If we had no slavery, if we were not enslaved by sin, you and I would be perfect. Is anyone here perfect? Don't raise your hand because you'll be hated. No one is perfect. Perfect. Now, this is not a license. Well, I'm not perfect. You're not perfect. Let's just mess up all together. No, we're not suggesting that. But what we are suggesting is we have a sin problem. It is a slavery problem. And God wants to set us free. And he gives us the ability to become free. Jesus said the following in, uh, in John 8, 34, as we continue to read on the scripture. He said this, Moses, so I say to you, whoever commits a sin is a slave to sin. A slave does not abide in the house forever, but a son abides forever. Therefore, if the son makes you free, you will be free indeed. The most hopeless people that I know, I've met a number through my life. I've met people that were so strung out in drugs, and I worked at a drug rehab in, in Brooklyn for a period of time in the summer. I've seen people mess up and... But you know the most hopeless people I've ever met in my life? They might not even realize they're hopeless. They're the people that have, think they have it all together. Like the man in the Bible says, oh, you've done well for yourself. Build bigger barns and say, I will relax. Those, Jesus says, you fool. Your soul will be required of you. It's the people that think they have it all together. Sometimes the greatest temptation is success. Sometimes the greatest temptation is when you get that pay raise, is when you are succeeding. You begin to think it's all you. Now, I'm not suggesting we all fail, but we must remember where our strength comes from. The Bible says a slave does not abide in the house forever. And I'm not talking about going to heaven or to hell. What we're talking about are the benefits that God has for us. We're not achieving and, and, and having the opportunity to experience what God has for us. Now, when I say you are a slave to sin, what I mean by that is we all have slavery issues in our life. But what we want to do, hopefully do, is like an onion, peel away layer after layer. And every year, you and I should be coming nearer and freer in God. This is what God wants us to do. Until we become like him. And so, therefore, if the son, let me read this again, a slave does not abide in the house forever, but, this is good news, a son abides forever, and you're in the house of God. Therefore, if the son makes you free, come on, let's say it, you shall? You shall be free indeed. It doesn't say you might be. If the son sets you free. There's a condition clause here, if. So there's a lot of ifs in our lives, and we have to let the Son set us free to be different. There's a lot of people today who are saying, you are what you are, your genetics make you what you are, you can't change, you have a predisposition to being an uh, Irish, and you have an Irish temper, or <laughs> whatever, you're, you know, all these different things. This is the way you are, your grandfather was this way, you're this way, and we're been, they're even telling people now that there's crime genes that are there, and you can't help people, and so personal responsibility Responsibility is being thrown out. But you know what? God has come. Jesus has come to set us free from the power of sin and death. 
He who sets the Son sets free is free indeed. My friends, one of the biggest things we have to do is believe. Jesus says constantly, let it be done according to your faith. And so we have to start raising the faith level. And faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of the Lord. My dream is that 2016 would be our best year yet. Why can't it be? It sure can be. Next week, we're going to deal with how do you jettison that one area you just can't seem to get over? You know what I'm talking about? Just this one, man, I, if I could just get rid of this one thing, I would just, how do we get rid of that? We'll talk about that next week. Why not this week? Because I want you to come next week. You see, you and I are, are triune beings, basically. We're mind, soul, and body. Or actually, we're spirit, soul, and body. Excuse me. We're spirit, soul, and body. And the soul consists of mind, will, and emotions. But we're triune beings. We have a spirit, we have a body, and we have a soul. And we're, not, we're supposed to love God with everything. But there's different areas of our lives that get hung up. And so, first of all, there is the un, unspiritual person, or the person whose spirit has not been redeemed or set apart for God or turned on. You see, the moment you and I sin, our spirit man, or the connection to us in God is broken. It's like it fries the connection. We had, a seri we had a situation this past summer where lightning struck the church or close to it, and it fried some of our electronics. It just didn't work. We had a call the people and they had to fix everything. Well, sometimes when you sin, it's like uh, it's something just fries your communication to God and something is lost. The communicated process inside of you, you were designed by God for God, gets broken. And in all of our lives, we're trying to connect that God vacuum with other things, success, um, hard work, whatever it could be. But with the moment we sin without God, that connection is broken. So we have the unspiritual person. When I say unspiritual, what I mean by that is a person whose spirit has been dormant or died because, they have, because they've sinned and not given their life to Christ. 1 Corinthians, you want to turn your Bibles, please, to 2.14. The Bible says the following. 1 Corinthians 12.14. But the natural man, without the spirit, okay, which basically in the Greek means soul-driven. Those that are soul-driven. In other words, they're controlled by their body and their soul. The spirit of God in them is not working out. And so their body and their soul is working it out. But the natural man without the spirit does not receive the things, excuse me, does not receive the things of the spirit of God. For their foolishness to him nor can he know them because they're spiritually discerned. This is why there's people out there, you can just tell them everything. You can, I mean, you can just show them that this is a little bottle from Costco and they'll see, they'll see something else. A little segue to drink. That's what you learn in seminary. Okay. Oh, God, come on. Give me, little, give me some grace here. It's the first Sunday of the year. All right. But the unspiritual person, and so this is the person who has not been alive to Christ and soul-driven. In other words, they're not controlled by the Spirit of God, but they're controlled by their own thing. People who have not come alive spiritually um, to the original God design, they're dormant, okay? They're running on soulish power or they're connecting their spirits to a wrong spirit, which is even worse, which begins to happen. It's like, imagine, imagine you, you can't see it all and somehow, or imagine this, you have blinders on, and all of a sudden you have glasses, and you can see. Or, or worse than that, suppose you can see, your vision's so poor, everything's kind of like shapes and all that. Then you get a brand new set of glasses, and wow, I can see everything now. You see, when, you, when the Spirit of God comes upon you, you can begin to see what you could not see before. See, at Cornerstone, we're concerned about waking people up spiritually. I mean, to, to work on behavior prior to having your spirit redeemed is a waste of time. That's why, you know, as much as we, we try to change society, and it's good to legislate, it's good to have good laws to help people make the right choices, those are all temporary but because once the safeguards are lifted, people will do what they want to do. How much better is it when a person's spirit is changed on the inside, that spirit man then gets to the, the soul and gets to the body? That is the most, that is the best change possible. And this is what God wants to do. And so our objective, really, is not to change everybody. Our objective is to get people to come to know Christ and let Christ change them. We want to encourage Christ to change them. We want to help 
Christ change him? Because if we have to change all by ourselves and we have to help you, forget about it. I can't help you. You can't help me. But if we give our lives to Jesus and we help each other, we complete each other, we cover each other's backs, we want to see each other grow to become the greatest people that God's called us to become. How much better is that? And I pray that this is an environment where you can come broken and can get healed. And that someone that is doing awesome, someone that has a phenomenal marriage and, and is doing well in every other area, when I look down on you, you'll say, wow, this person wants to help me. You see, God doesn't bless us just for ourselves. He blesses us to be a blessing to each other. So that's the, we have the unspiritual person that's dead. Then you have the, the second thing is this. Number two, you have the spiritual person. The spirit man comes alive. They give their life to Jesus Christ. And something that was dead in the, book of, in the book of Genesis, when Adam and Eve sinned, that thing was shorted out. But when they give your life to Christ, it is reconnected and the communication line is open and now there is a regeneration that begins to happen. It says in 1 Corinthians 2.15, as we continue to read the same set of verses, but he who is spiritual judges all things, yet he himself is rightly judged by no one. Their spirit has come alive. You see, the reason why you and I struggle with our New Year's resolutions or trying to change is because we work on the wrong area. We're trying to change by willpower, which is our soul. We try to change by disciplining our body. And the problem is you continue to work on your soul and your body. It's not going to bring lasting change. We're working on the wrong thing. But if you work on your spirit, man, and have it subjected to God, then the change is not no longer you. It comes from God. Jesus said, out of your innermost being will flow rivers of living water. It doesn't say a reservoir. It says rivers, which means there's a source it's coming from and flowing through. So if you're trying to change by your own merits and your own strength and your own discipline, some of us are a lot more disciplined than others. Good luck. I've learned that I, am very, I fail when I try to change with my own strength and my own way. It does not work. When I get to the place saying, God, I can't do this. I need you to work through me. Father, in you, I can do all things. This is why it's so important. To, the devil will say, you can't do it. This is the way you are. You, you're just born this way. You, you're not very smart. You, you're, you're just a person that cannot achieve anything. Your, your parents were, were poor. You're poor. Your mom got a divorce. Your dad got a divorce twice. And you're going to get a divorce too. No, I can do all things through Christ. And we have to do is to let the Spirit of God come alive in us. You see, and that's the secret, folks. What does it say in one of the most important verses in the Bible? Matthew 6, 33. Seek what? First, the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added to you as well. What we need to do is realize if your spirit man is strengthened, then there's potential for God to work in every other area of your life. Instead of just being your own might and strength, you will be coming along with God. It's like climbing a hill or going down a hill with a wind at your back. You still do the action, but God is with you. And this is what happened. God told Joshua, every place you place your foot, it will be yours. And God has given us the promised land of his blessings. But we still have to go out and fight, but we fight with the Lord. There's a vast difference of fighting with the Lord and fighting by yourself. If you want to fight by yourself, you're going to fail. And if you do win, you'll, get, you'll still fail because you'll get a big, get a big head. So hey, either way, it's not good. The best way to change your life is to change your life spiritually because spiritually you last forever. Your body and your soul it kind of falls apart, but your spirit man lives forever. Why invest in cotton candy? Why invest in sand castles where the tide comes in and washes them out when you can invest in castles built upon a rock that lasts forever? You see, any spiritual investment you do is both here and forevermore. And so if we're going to see real change in our lives, we have to work on the spirit man. And the beautiful thing is that God wants to work with us. Isn't that good news? All right. The spiritual part of you will help change the natural parts. Changing from the outside in, it works. But how much better is when, why did Jesus come the first time? People thought Christ was going to come as a conquering king and come in here, wipe out the Romans and start up a new God. He didn't do that. What did he do? He conquered first the hearts of men. 
Because God understands the way we really change a society is not by military might. It's by, it's by the might of a changed heart. Then he'll come back and do the rest part. So if you and I are going to see lasting change in our lives, we must work on our spiritual man. It's the most important thing you and I can do. If that's the only resolution you have this year, let me tell you, it's the best one you can ever make. Because that, seeking him first, all these other things will begin to take care of themselves because the Holy Spirit will lead you and give you strength. 1 Corinthians 2, 15, 16 says, we're continuing to read the same passage. But he who is spiritual judges all things, yet he himself rightly judged by no one. For who has known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. I don't want to mind my own business. I want God to mind my business. That's the problem. It's not your business. It's God's business. We need to have the mind of Christ. This is why it's so important. I'm going to give a little advertisement to get into the Word every day. Every day, get into the Word. If you can't read, listen to it. Get into the Word, and the Word is powerful. We don't, we don't read the Word to know about God. We read the Word to know God. You don't go on a date with somebody, if you're trying to date somebody, to find out all this information so you can write a novel. No, you go out with them, not as a reporter, but you go out with them to know them, to have a relationship. So there's a difference between reading the Bible to get information and reading the Bible for relationship. When you read the Bible, ask God, open my eyes. I want to see which, who you are. So our main goal should be building our spirits. And what a great time January is. You know, it's a fresh slate. In fact, every day is a fresh slate. Giving God the first. That's why it's so important. I think it's important. That's why in 21 days in January, we want to give God the first of our year. That's why I think it's important to give God first fruits. Give the first. That's why the tithe is important. You're giving the first to God. You give it to God, the rest of it's blessed. I believe that. We've, we've found that. We've seen that God meets our needs. I give God the first of the day. When I give God the first, now I understand Charles Spurgeon says, I don't dare look into another man's face until I've seen the face of God. And I had a friend of mine uh, from Israel say, that is, that is a fantasy for a mother with children. <laughs> and that's true. I understand that. But how about this? You get up in the morning. God, this day is not my day. I release this day to you. Even if it's a one-minute prayer. Acknowledging that it is God's. And so what a great opportunity we have to have an opportunity to begin to put ourselves on the right path. That's what's so important about Sundays. What is Sunday? It's the first day of the week. You have God Sunday, and you say, God, this is your day, and then the rest of your week will be blessed. We believe that. That's why it's important. That's why they met on the first day, partially. And so we can set the course and set the trajectory of our life. It's good to have a good upstart, isn't it? And so this is a good startup company, starting in January. And then we have, we have the uh, unspiritual person. Okay, that's a carnal person that's run by the world. And we have the spiritual person. And then we have the third thing is called the worldly person. What's a worldly person? Well, it's also cardinal as well. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 3, verse 1, And I, brethren, could not speak to you. This is the Apostle Paul speaking to the spiritual church. And I, brethren, could not speak to you as spiritual people, but as carnal, as babes in Christ. What does a baby do? A baby's carnal, right? I mean, everything in his body said, oh, he's, he's so, so cute. Here, have a little bop. You know, <laughs> it's cool when they're small, right? I mean, it's all carnal. Everything is based upon their body functions. Unfortunately, it gets the same way when you get old. Anyhow, uh, but um, <laughs> that's not funny. Okay. <laughs> and brother, I could not speak to your spiritual people, but as carnal, as to babes in Christ. Why? They were so led by their flesh. They're carnal. Their body controls them. Their soulish man controls them. Their spirit man is weak. Whatever you feed leads. If you feed your spirit man, it leads. If you feed your flesh, it leads. It's just the way it is. I wish it was different, but it's not just a hope and a wishing. Whatever you invest in, invest in you. If you invest in God, you'll find that God in you will work. The divine you will come alive. He says, I could not address you as being people of the Spirit. You are, you are sarks or, or carnal, Latin for flesh. 
We're Christians, but we have a lot of flesh in us, don't we? We're believers, but we got these chunks of flesh that are still not completely subjected to the Lord. That's why we make mistakes. That's why we do what we do, but God loves us anyhow. But he wants to see us to become free. It's because our spirit man is not strong enough to deal with the flesh man. Do you see that? You feed your spirit, your spirit will beat up the flesh. You feed your flesh, your flesh man will beat up your spirit man. It's just the way it is, folks. It just, that's just the way it is. I wish it was different, but that's the way it is. It's real simple, though, isn't it? Though? Here's the good news. You can live a different life if you and I will work on the spiritual man. Do you understand that? Listen, this is, a, this is the way to position yourself for change. The way to position yourself for change is to work on the most important part of you that goes forever. It's called your spirit. There's nothing more important than working on your spirit. And we can move forward. And so I believe if we apply these things in our lives, I believe we can really see lasting change because God says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And he can change your situation. He can change your marriage. He can tra change a predisposition to a certain lifestyle. He can change maybe addictions you struggle with. He can change mindsets. He can change hereditary issues. He can change even health issues. God can change it. Why? Because I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me. We believe that. Now, what does Paul go on to say later on? What does he say? Continue on the same verse. We read the, uh, verse 1. Now we go to verse two and three. I fed you with milk and not solid food, for until now you are not able to receive it. You see, God wants to give us more. But if we don't get past the bottle, if we don't start growing spiritual teeth, and, and you know what I'm saying? God wants to give us more. I mean, he, wants not, he doesn't want us being babies for the rest of our lives. Spiritual bedwetting gets tiring after a while. God wants to get us by ourselves, right? You want to wear pull-ups when you're 35 years old, right? And that's what begins to happen. God wants to grow us up. He loves us. He wants to give us more things. And I wish I go to church and I want something deeper. Well, you know what the most deep thing is? Is to work on your spirit, man. That's the most important thing. It says, I fed you with milk, for until now you were not able to receive it. And even now you're still not able, for you're still carnal. You're still worked by your flesh. Now, how do you know you got the flesh working in your life? They'll give you, some, they'll give you some, uh, some symptoms of that. Here it is. For where there's envy, strife, divisions among you, are you not carnal, behaving like mere men? Okay, if you have strife, fighting among one another, that's mine, that's mine. All you gotta do is go if you want to and you can sign up for the nursery, give a background check and you can see what happens with the kids. That's mine. I mean, there, there's this toy that's dormant. No one's touching it. A little boy, a little girl decides to touch it. All of a sudden, it's the hottest commodity on the planet. Everybody has to have that right now, right? It's the carnality in us. So we need to draw on God's power. See, Galatians 5, 17 says this. It says, for the desires of the flesh are against the spirit. There is literally a war going on. I wish we could just, I like what Jack Hayford said. I shared it with you uh, several weeks ago. He says, so many people try to, try to cast out the flesh, right? They try to cast out the flesh and discipline a demon. <laughs> so many times we think it's all spiritual. It's just our own flesh. And so that's all part of it. We need to draw on God's power. For desires of the flesh are against the spirit, and the desires of the spirit are against the flesh. So we have this war. Okay, the question is, who's the one in charge? The flesh or the spirit? Now, this is the good news. Good news, you and I have a choice to change. You and I can make that choice. God will not force you to choose him. He gives you a choice. He gives me a choice. Which one will we choose? Which one will be stronger than the two? Whatever you feed leads. Remember that. I want you to say that out loud. Whatever you feed leads. If you feed the flesh, the flesh leads. If you feed the spirit, the spirit leads. Right? That's the answer right there. It's real simple. This is so huge, guys. Uh, well, it's so easy. It's so, I know, I know. The most profound things in life are the simplest. These are the fundamentals of the game of life. If we have a lot of worldliness in us and a little bit of God, how are you supposed to do it? If you, if you have a diet of world all day long, 
world, 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 world. We give, we give uh, the rest of the world 13 hours a day and we give God 15 seconds. What do you think's gonna happen, folks? This is not condemnation, this is an opportunity to be better. It's my objective of this church to help you on your spiritual journey, to take one step closer to Christ every time we meet together. That's all part of it. Here's the problem and here's the solution, all right? I know uh, this is a lot of information today, so I'm gonna try to uh, synthesize it a little faster, but this is important. I appreciate your tracking with me. We'll get some pragmatic and practical steps right after this. But I wanna bring something to your attention. Matthew 17, 14 through 18. At the foot of the mountain, a large, Jesus was preaching here. A large crowd was waiting for them. A man came and knelt before Jesus and said, Lord, have mercy on my son. He has seizures and suffers terribly. He often falls into the fire, into the water. So I brought him to one of your, disi to your disciples, but they couldn't help him. Jesus said this, you faithless and corrupt people, how long must I be with you? How long must I put up with you? Bring the boy here to me. Then Jesus rebuked the demon in the boy, and it left him. From that moment on, the boy was well. Now, in this particular story, there's some points I want to bring to your attention. It's going to be a little bit, uh, ladies and gentlemen. We're not quite ready to do communion yet. Okay, he says, Oh, believing generation. In a way, Jesus is saying to us, Why can't you seem to have victory? Jesus, we don't understand. Why can't we cast out this demon? What's going on? And see, you understand something. They were having great success. Jesus sent them out, gave them power. Demons were cast out. People were getting healed. Then they get to this one person. They can't make it happen. Look, Jesus, what's the deal? I can't do this. Why is that, Jesus? Okay? How many of us? We have success in so many areas of our lives. We've overcome so much. But this one area, we're like, I don't understand. I just can't get rid of this. And Jesus says, it's, you carnal person, you. <laughs> well, thanks, Jesus. You perverse and unbelieving generation. And I believe that Jesus brought up two main problems. It's this. Unbelieving and not connected to God. You carnal and unbelieving people. How we get free is we need to get unconnected and connected. We need to get unconnected from the world and connected to God. That's how we do it. Your problem is not connected to and connected. What are you connected to? And this is all part of the issue, Jesus says this. They asked him privately. They said, Jesus, in verse 17, verse 19, excuse me. After the disciples said, asked privately, hey, Jesus, thanks for, you know, thanks for pulling us out in front of everybody, embarrassing us. But anyhow, he, they didn't say that. But anyhow, but they pulled him aside privately because they just got to rut for publicly. They pulled him aside privately and said this. Why can't we cast out the demon, Jesus? What, what's the story here? He says this, you don't have enough faith, Jesus told them. I tell you the truth. If you had faith of even a mustard seed, you could say to this mountain, move from here to there. It will move. Nothing will be impossible. Why couldn't they drive it out? Because they didn't have enough faith. Why can't we drive out these things that encumber us and hold us and shackle us? I believe many times it's because we do not have enough faith. Why is it the same resolution keeps coming up every year in and out, year in and out, year in and out, same thing over and over? Why does it keep coming back? I tell you why, it's a spiritual issue. In fact, every issue of our life is spiritual because you're spiritual beings. When we stop trying to change with our flesh and our soul and understand it's spiritual. Your marriage is spiritual. Your diet is spiritual. How you spend your time is spiritual. How you work is spiritual. How you chew gum is spiritual. Everything's spiritual. I want to encourage you. It doesn't make a difference of your genetics. It doesn't make a difference of your past. It doesn't make a difference of what people have told you or said to you. You can change by the grace and the power of God. Nothing is impossible with God. See, the problem is this. We're too connected to the world, and we're not connected enough to God. It's real simple. It's, I wish it was more profound. Mm, that's real deep. <laughs> Yeah, it is real deep. It will change my life and your life. Now, why? How do, what does he say? He says this one. He says, this one does not come out except by prayer and fasting. I want to encourage you. Prayer connects us to God. And fasting disconnects us from our flesh. Connected to God 
and disconnected from your flesh. How's that happen? Prayer and fasting is a very powerful discipline, both in the Old Testament and New Testament. You want to put a turbo charge on that change? You want to put a supercharge on that change? Try prayer and fasting. Not just getting over the cookies and cakes you had over the holidays. Okay, that's not what we're talking about. What we're talking about is prayer. And a lot of us have done these fasts in the past, but we, we spent so much time on the fast, we've lost the reason for it. The reason for it is to help your spirit. To what it does is it breaks down your, your flesh, man, and it makes you aware. Every time I get a hunger pang, I remember my flesh is going to be in subjection to God. So why prayer and fasting? Well, prayer connects us with God. If you pray, you'll have more connection with God. You're just walking with God. Fasting helps you disconnect from the world okay we're going to talk about in a few moments how we can do this okay i'm going to break it down real practical and we're going to have communion fasting disconnects us from the world now some christian religions they get all legalistic and there's a place in columbia where these people climb a thousand feet on their knees to go to a monastery and they try to make god happy with them go to the stations of the cross they get up from the top there their legs are bleeding they're walking forth and or you're in a cold monastery with a now, that's not what god wants us to do he doesn't want to make us miserable he wants to make us whole and so fasting is a way to discipline our flesh this one does not come out by fasting and prayer. I had a person come to me a little while ago and say, the situation you're facing in your family, not my immediate family, but your family, is going to take prayer and fasting. You've done everything you can do. Now all you can do is pray and fast. And he's absolutely right. And so this is a good opportunity for all of us. What are the areas? Prayer connects us to God. Fasting connects us, disconnects us from the world. What would happen if you and I would take an opportunity to fast and pray this season, I'll tell you what would happen. You and I would get momentum to move forward in a new capacity, a new way. I love what the Romans 8, 12 says. Therefore, dear brothers and sisters, talking to the church, you have no obligation to do what your sinful nature urges you to do. You do not have to do what your body tells you to do. You don't have to live the life that you've been told you have to live. Just because you have an urge doesn't mean you have to do it. You are under no obligation to live in sin. We're under no obligation to be sick. We're under no obligation to suffer with these, these vices in our life. You're under no obligation to be, to be addicted to cigarettes or alcohol or a worry or whatever it is. You're under no obligation to pornography, to adultery. You're under no obligation to worry. You're under no obligation to being a, a person who spends too much money. You're under no obligation to these things. You're under no obligation. The world says you're under obligation. And the Word of God says, no, you're not. Don't tell me I am. God is greater and greater. He, the flesh was killed on the cross so the spirit man could rise. Because he died, you and I can rise. Not only for heaven, but for now. You are under no obligation. I declare to you in the first Sunday of 2016, you're under no obligation to your flesh. Don't believe the lie. Romans 8, 13, for if you live by the dictates of your flesh, you will die. But if by the power of the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the sinful flesh. It doesn't say muster up more strength. No, by the power of the Spirit. We're like little David with a slingshot. you got this Goliath in your life. You come to me, I come to you in the name of the Lord God. He takes that sling. you got to do your part. But release that stone and let God take down the giants of our lives. Who are your giants? Maybe get out your iPad or iPhone or Android or no, no droid, whatever. And why don't you write down a foe that you want to overcome over these 21 days to begin. Come on, let's just be serious about this. I'm calling Cornerstone. And all those watching, let's get serious. Let's feed the spirit and kill the flesh. So we're having 21 days of prayer and fasting. I want to encourage you to do it. We'll get into the more, we'll get more to, the, to how we do it in a few moments. I know I'm going long, but uh, there's so much to cover in this. But I forgot today was communion, but nevertheless, we'll, we'll get through this. If we can't do it, we'll do it next week. 
But what you do with the first of the month? I know, but you know, sometimes you change things. Monday through Friday from 6 to 7 a.m. sharp, 6 a.m. to 7 a.m., we're going to have a time of prayer here. We're going to have a little bit of worship, five or 10 minutes of, maybe 10, 10 12, 13 minutes of word. Then we're going to have you pray for 30 minutes. Then we're going to gather at the end, the last 15 minutes, and touch on things together. And we're going to pray. And you'll get yourself in a good habit. Now, if you can't make it, I understand. We're going to have a live stream so you can, you can watch it during the day. Not when you're driving the car, but during the day. Here are some objectives. Number one, set your objective. James 4, 2 through 3 says, you have not because you ask not. Well, I'm just going to pray. No, God likes people that are directive. Why not set a goal? Why not set a goal? I want to stop this particular thing in my life. I want to spend more time with God. I want to be more patient with my kids. I want to be, I want to not wait to the last minute forever. Whatever it could be, okay? You do not have to, but you ask. And so when you ask, you do not receive because you ask with wrong motives that you may spend on what you get. Here's what I want to tell God. I want to tell this. I want to tell God this year. The first one is this. I declare my complete dependence upon God. It's not for me. It's God. I need God first in my life, and so do you. And then I want to ask, I want to do that. I want to spend this time of, of saying, God, I give it all to you. I'm, I'm, I'm beginning to strip away. You know, sometimes it says, break up fallow ground and search me. You know, if you think you have no issues in your life, you have more issues than anyone else I know. There are all, all of us have areas in our lives we can become free of. Why wouldn't you want to take the opportunity to have more freedom? And when you have hundreds of other people doing the same thing, I think it's encouraging. So declare it depends upon God. God, you're it. Number two is this. Ask for forgiveness of yourself and our country. This is a very vital year, 2016, in the political landscape. There's a lot of things that are happening this new year. And also, not only that, but internationally. We need to pray for forgiveness for our land and ourselves. And what else we want to do? So we, we, we commit ourselves to God. And we also, the third thing, is we want to refocus spiritually. We want to set up some good habits and good patterns for this new year. And this is the final one I wanted to encourage you about. Believe that God answers prayers, because he does. And pray for someone in your life that could come to know Christ. So that's the first thing. You know, set your objective. The second thing I'd say to us today is decide what you'll do. There are going to be some mornings that you, you're like, it's too cold, it's, it's seven degrees out, it's not Christmas with a t-shirt this day. <laughs> It's too cold. I can't get out. I mean, it happens to me too. I don't want to get up. Like, oh no, this feels good. Stay in bed. Oh yes. No, I'm gonna get up. I'm gonna discipline my flesh. It's gonna be. It's gonna be a discipline. Listen. If you keep doing what you're always doing, you keep getting what you're always getting. If you want to see it change, something's got to break. And this is a good way to break it. Make a decision and keep it. Here's some fasting options. I want to encourage you to make Sunday a priority every week. Don't just come once or twice a month or once every six months or whenever you have a, a situation in the family, why not make a decision? I'm going to get God the first part of my week. I'm going to invest every day in God. Now, there's this this four different fasting options, and we're almost done here, okay? <laughs> I keep on saying that, but I just want to let everyone know. We're not going to do uh, communion today, okay? I'm sorry about that. We'll do it next week. Uh, the first thing is a complete fast. What you do only do is water and you juice juices. I don't suggest that for everybody, because that's something that takes a lot of, uh, you need to ask your doctor first. But that's a powerful way to fast. A selective fast, certain types of food, like a Daniel fast, where you cut out meats and sweets and, and, and things, carbohydrates and meat and sweets, and you just focus on that. And why do you do that for? Because it helps you remember. You're saying, God, I'm giving this to you. Or maybe a partial fast, where you, you fast lunch or breakfast and you have dinner at night, but don't go gorge yourself at night. So you have a complete fast, a selective fast, a partial fast. Or well, how about this? If you, you, medically you can't do it, how about a soul fast? How about we fast electronics, except for work-related electronics? What would happen? We just turn the TV off for a whole month, for 21 days. Excuse me, not a whole month. 21 days, no electronics, no games, no Facebook, no Instagram, and all that, all the gram, okay? It's just, you turn off the television, what would happen? What would happen to us? We actually make talk to each other. Why not disconnect yourself from the world for a moment? No movies, no TV. Now, I'm not saying you have to, but why not try to do something like that? So as a family, we're going to do that. 
We'll discuss it later. <laughs> I'm going to do what I'm going to do. What I'm going to do. <laughs> the kids are going to burn their mattresses. Okay. Finally, I want you to expect results, everybody. Expect results. Isaiah 58, 8 through 9 says this. Then your light will... This is talking about fasting. And you fast correctly. Then your light will break forth like the dawn, and your healing will quickly appear. Then your righteousness will go before you, and the glory of the Lord will be your rear guard. Then you will call, and the Lord will answer. You will cry for help, and he will say, Here I am. Am. I want to pray over you every day this 21 day. I'm going to pray for healing. I'm going to pray that this year would be a, a, a year that relationships are healed, emotions are healed, bodies are healed. I want to pray for wholeness, holiness, that we become more like God and that God will help us. Amen? All right. So that's what I want to encourage you. As you leave here today, uh, if you don't have this already, we have these little ba- bracelets to remind you called Pray First. And we also have these prayer booklets. So I encourage you to help you know how to pray. Can we go forward and make a difference this year? Let's make this 21 days something powerful. Six to seven every day, this Wednesday night at seven to eight, and and Saturdays from nine to 10, we're gonna be having prayer. Let's focus these 21 days. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, I wanna thank you so much for the opportunity of a new year, Lord. Thank you for 2016. We thank you that the, behold, I'm making all things new. The past is gone. Lord, we want to forget what lies behind. We want to press forward to what lies ahead, to the high calling of Jesus Christ. Father, I ask in Jesus' name that Cornerstone this year, us watching and here right now, we would see things broken off. Lord, that we'd hear testimonies of people saying my marriage was healed. I I got off this addiction. This lifestyle choice I had has been changed. Lord, I just pray in Jesus' name that we'd see great freedom come to this place, that we'd be so connected to you, God, that our strength would be uh, heightened and made stronger in Jesus' name. Now I'm going to ask you a question. Some of you are not connected to God yet. You, you just have never connected to God. You, you believe in God, but you've never said, God, I give my life to you. Today can be that day. I want to encourage you. I'm going to pray a prayer right now. If you'll pray this with your heart and believe in your mind, it will be a new day. Let's pray right now and quietly in your own heart. Lord Jesus, I believe you are the Son of God. I ask you to forgive me of all of my sins. I choose to walk away from being the boss of my life. I declare today that you are my God and I will follow you. Forgive me of my sins and give me the strength to walk for you from this day forward in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. I'm not going to ask you to come up. I'm not going to do like that today, but I'm just going to ask if you could be so kind to fill one of these cards out and put it into one of the um, receptacles. Or you say, Pastor, I prayed that prayer today. Just show a quick show of hands. Pastor, I prayed that prayer today. I'm ready to make a change. Anyone today? Okay. Let's all stand as we conclude with one closing song, and we'll have communion next week. Is that all right, everybody? Okay. bless you. Let's walk out with the power of God. Let's make this 21 days something to make a new path. Amen. Amen. God bless you all. If you need prayer, come forward. We have the prayer team.